On this week in Enterprise Tech, we have Mr. Brian G. and Mr. Curse Flanken here today, and we're going to talk about and try to elevate your cybersecurity game for the 20th anniversary of Cybersecurity Awareness Month. We're going to go get a fresh perspective from CISOs out there and how to advance your organization's security literacy. Plus, we're going to revisit the topic of puny code. Yes, we covered it last episode, but Josh Kuao of Infoblox is here, and he's going to talk about some groundbreaking techniques to actually combat the DNS conundrum. Definitely shouldn't miss it. Quiet on the set. Podcasts you love from people you trust. This, this is Twit. Twit. This is Twit. This week in Enterprise Tech, episode 567, recorded October 27th, 2023. Lost in translation. This episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by Lookout. Whether on a device or in the cloud, your business data is always on the move. Minimize risk, increase visibility, and ensure compliance with Lookout's unified platform. Visit Lookout.com today. And by Collide. Collide is a device trust solution for companies with Okta, and they ensure that if a device isn't trusted and secure, it can't log into your cloud apps. Visit Collide.com slash Twyatt to book an on-demand demo today. And by Miro, the online workspace for innovation, where your team can dream, design, and build the future together from any location. Tap into a way to map processes, visualize content, run retrospectives, and keep all your documents and data in one place. Get your first three boards for free at Miro.com slash podcast. Welcome to Twyatt This Week in Enterprise Tech, the show that is dedicated to you, the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and the geek who just wants to know how this world's connected. I'm your host, Louis Moresca, your guide to the big world of the enterprise, but I can't guide you myself by myself. I need to bring in the professionals and the experts are their very own Mr. Brian G. Chebert. It's always great to see you, my friend. How are you doing this week? I'm doing good. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to f- confess right up front, Josh is one of my er- earliest students. I'm quite proud of him. Um, he's actually followed it. He's got one book that's on his shelf already. And uh, we're actually going to be talking just a little, little bit of uh, hints and teasers about book number two coming out from him and his writing partner. So that's going to be cool. fun. And then, of course, Kurt and I are both getting ready for Maker Fair this coming week. And uh, truth be told, I'm kind of losing my mind trying to whack down and get rid of all my to-do lists before Maker Fair starts to move in. I hear you. I hear you. Well, hopefully it goes over smooth. Usually when there bumps in the road before time, things go smooth after that. So we'll, uh, we'll cross our fingers for you. Well, well I've folks, already, we also patched, have to, I've already oh. patched my bumps in the road. I was that's, actually, that's right. You were literally patching the bumps in the road. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Very nice. Sorry, I couldn't resist that one. <laughs> Thanks, Chief. Well, we also have to welcome back our very own Mr. Curtis Franklin, Principal Analyst at MDA, and he's the man with the pulse of the enterprise. Curtis, it's great to have you back on. How's your week going? Oh, it's been a busy and productive week, so uh, we'll call it a win. I'm uh, getting ready for a number of things to be published, been doing briefings with a number of different companies, uh, learning lots about uh, interesting topics like risk quantification and professional cybersecurity training, you know, cool stuff like that. Uh, as Brian said, I'm getting ready for the Orlando Maker Fair, which uh, <clears throat> should be pleasantly exhausting. Uh, you know, for it, we've been getting ready, uh, my beautiful wife Carol and I getting things made to uh, display there and organizing uh, various exhibition pieces. And then starting Tuesday night, I go pick up really heavy things uh, to get ready to move them in over at the Central Florida Fairgrounds. So it's going to be a lot of fun. I cannot wait to see all the creativity on display at uh, yet another great Maker Fair. Well, speaking of fun stuff, definitely stick around because we're going to try to elevate your cybersecurity game. 
talking through the 20th anniversary Cybersecurity Awareness Month. We're going to get you a fresh perspective from CISOs out there to how to advance to your organization's security literacy. We're going to walk through some common themes. Plus, we're going to revisit the topic of Puny Code. This week, we have Josh Kuau from Infoblox, and he's going to take us through some groundbreaking techniques to actually combat the DNS conundrum. So definitely stick around to later because we have lots more to talk about. But before we do, let's jump into this week's news blips. Today, we've delved into a critical development that's raising eyebrows across the board. A cadre of academic researchers have pulled the curtain back on a new attack called eye leakage that exploits a side channel of vulnerability in Apple's A and M series CPUs. You heard that right. CPUs running on your modern iOS and macOS devices are under the microscope here. The eye leakage is practical and resource light, but let's not underestimate the technical prowess required to use it. This exploit requires extensive reverse engineering of Apple hardware and deep rooted expertise in side channel vulnerabilities. The culprit, speculative execution, a feature admit of boosting a CPU performance, which has ironically become the Achilles heel in a number of attacks in the recent years. Now, the question is, how does this actually work? Well, imagine visiting a seem, uh, an innocuous website, right, on your iOS or macOS device. This website powered by JavaScript can then open another site of the attacker's choosing and harvest sensitive data. Now we're talking about whether it's Gmail content or your autofill passwords, even your YouTube history. The attack takes roughly five minutes to profile the target machine and an additional 30 seconds to extract a 520 bit secret. Now this is where the major issue actually steps in. While the export specifically targets Safari on Macs, all browsers, that's right, all of them on iPhones and iPads are vulnerable because they're based on Apple's WebKit engine. Apple's in the loop and has plans to address this in the upcoming software releases. In the grand scheme of things, this discovery is yet another chapter in the never-ending saga of speculative execution vulnerabilities. If you remember Spectre and Meltdown fiascos from 2018, you know that this is hack is, you know, keeps on hacking. While chip makers are running in circles devising mitigations, and on, the onus is now on Apple to plug this loophole. Now, if you're worried about your fleet of devices in your organization, the only thing you need to stay say to your organization is Stay up to date. The moment one comes out, force your fleet to upgrade. Well, the criminal group that has been in the news most recently for the MGM and Caesars Entertainment ransomware attacks has reached a new level of recognition with Microsoft's security teams elevating it to, quote, one of the world's most dangerous financial criminal groups, end quote. That's according to a new article on Dark Reading. The English speaking group, known as Scatter Swine, UNC 3944, or as Microsoft calls it, Octotempest, has usually been part of adversary in the middle uh, techniques, though they have also used social engineering involving doing things like calling their targets directly and SIM swapping. The group has been known to carry out cryptocurrency theft, data leak extortion, and ransomware attacks. On that latter point, it became a black cat Alf V affiliate in mid 2023. And other than the casino hospitality tax in September, the group previously made a name for itself by specializing in successfully compromising Okta credentials in a spate of attacks, including the widespread Twilio leak last August. Now, the Microsoft report on the group notes that the this group is rapidly growing in skill and sophistication, writing, Octo Tempest leverages tradecraft that many organizations don't have in their typical threat models. The well-organized, prolific nature of Octo Tempest's attacks is indicative of extensive technical depth and multiple hands-on keyboard operators. Now, researchers note that Octo Tempest's apparent organizational skill and sheer number of uh, tactics make it a very challenging adversary to plan for. While cybersecurity teams can prepare for specific known attack vectors, the traditional defenses are still the best. Train your employees on the signs of social engineering and message-borne attacks to be aware of, and keep your systems up to date with patches and updates. So this Ars Technica um, article, is, we've actually heard different versions of this about what Apple thinks. So if we set the Wayback Machine, um, I still remember Burke and Leo and a whole bunch of, you know, folks at the uh, Brick House or the whatever we call the new studio 
um, trying out the system where you go and you try and do a repair that yourself, yourself, they ship you the toolkit and the information on how to do the repair. I vaguely remember the toolkit taking so long to come in that Burke and company only had a couple of days to do the repair. Well, so the bottom line is, even though Apple had started in that direction, there's still a lot of friction. So this uh, Ars Technical article, article reads like this, right to repair advocates have long stated that passing repair laws in individual states was worth the uphill battle. Once enough states demanded that manufacturers make parts, repair guides, and diagnostic tools available, few companies would want to differentiate their offerings and policies and would instead pivot to national availability. So this last Tuesday, Apple finally did exactly that. Following the passage of California's repair bill that Apple supported, requiring seven years of part specialty tools and repair manual availability, Apple announced Tuesday that it would back a similar bill on a federal level. It would also make its parts, tools, and repair documentation available to both non-affiliated repair shops and individual customers at, quote, at fair and reasonable prices. So while some will discount these changes as being chicken little and say that the vast majority of users aren't willing to do repairs themselves, I say that's not really the point. It's making the specialized tools and repair documentation more available to reduce the guesswork currently being done. When I got started in the industry running a warranty repair center for Toshiba, Okidata, Canon, blah, 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 those manuals meant technicians could potentially do repairs with the same quality as manufacturer repair centers, while providing the tech could and would read them. Well, this hopefully will also reduce the number of bogus parts that could damage a product, or in one case that I heard about, puncture a lithium battery and cause the fire. Well, standardization of repair par part procedure parts and procedures is a great thing. Oh, and by the way, it should hopefully also normalize repair costs. A pro-Russia hacking group known as Winter Vermin has been exploiting a zero-day vulnerability in the RoundCube webmail so software, a platform used by a thousand webmail services and a million end users across the web. And their targets? Well, of course, government entities and think tanks across Europe, of course. Let's dive deep into the issue here. Now, the vulnerability stems from a critical cross-site scripting error. All it took for users to view a malicious email and presto, JavaScript was injected into the RoundCube server, causing it to forward selected emails to a server controlled by the hackers. No clicks, no downloads, just viewing the email triggered the exploit. Now, researchers from firm ESET summed it up in a quote, quote, no manual interaction other than viewing the message in a web browser is required. ESET detected these attacks on October 12th, just a day after they actually began. They promptly informed RoundCube and patch was actually issued on October 14th. Now this vulnerability is identified as CVE 2023-5631. Now this, this issue or winter vervin is actually no stranger to cyber espionage. They've been active since at least 2020, focusing on targets primarily in Europe and Central Asia. Now, earlier this year, they targeted U.S. officials supporting Ukraine, exploiting a different cross-site scripting vulnerability in Zimbra collaboration software. If you're running RoundCube, either as an admin or an end user, it's time to pull up your socks and ensure your software is actually patched. Winter Vervin's previous exploits serve as a forewarning that complacency isn't an option. Well, folks, that does it for the blips. Next up, we have the news bites. But before we get to the news bites, we do have to thank a really great sponsor of this week at Enterprise Tech, and that's Lookout. Business has evolved forever. Boundaries to where we work or even how we work have literally disappeared. That means your data is always on the move, whether on a device, in the cloud, across networks, or even at a local coffee shop. Well, that's great for your workforce. It's great for me. It's a challenge for IT security. That's where Lookout steps in. Lookout helps you control your data and free your workforce at the same time. Now with Lookout, you'll gain complete visibility in all your data so you can minimize risk from external and internal threats. Plus you can ensure compliance across your organization. By seamlessly securing hybrid work, your organization doesn't have to sacrifice productivity 
for security. And Lookout makes IT security a lot simpler. In fact, working with multi-endpoint solutions and legacy tools in today's environment is just too complex. With its single unified platform, Lookout reduces IT complexity, giving you more time to focus on whatever else comes your way. Good data protection isn't a cage, it's a springboard, and it should enable you and your organization to leap forward into the future of your making. Visit Lookout.com today to learn how to safeguard data, secure hybrid work, and reduce IT complexity. That's Lookout.com. And we thank Lookout for their support of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, it's time for the News Bites. Now, this week, we, we, we all know it's the 20th anniversary of Cybersecurity Awareness Month, and we have a great article that takes us through nine innovative ways to boost security hygiene for cybersecurity awareness. In fact, there's a lot of testaments here from CISOs all over the industries. Now, the focus is not just reinforcing old habits, but actually innovating ways or innovative ways to actually improve your security posture. Now, let's address the elephant in the room first user responsibility. That's one of the big ones. Now, uh, Windows Snyder of Thistle Technologies actually argues that the owner should actually solely be on end users to avoid malicious clicks. That's right. Don't focus on end users actually making mistakes because they will. Instead, she advocates for platforms to design them and minimize risk for software vulnerabilities, such as adopting memory safe languages, of course, in your software. She also stresses that robust software like Mac iOS and Chromium already have built in Rails to actually and guardrails to actually protect your users. But we can't ignore the human factor. That's right. Kurt John, CISO at Expedia, pushes for grassroots approach here. He suggests actually deputizing volunteers across your organization as, quote, security champions. I've actually seen this work really well in some organizations. Furthermore, John actually champions rotational programs that allow employees to temporarily trade places with security members that allows for more of an embedded approach and a more of a two-way street for understanding. And there's also Blue Schneier. He's uh, a name that's synonymous with security. He stays, actually says, stop, stop telling people not to click on URLs. In fact, Josh, I'm sure we'll get to this later as well. He calls out for actionable, straightforward guidance that users can follow easily, like you know that public health mantra that we always see, wash your hands, right? Now, Phil Venables, he's a Google Cloud. He addresses the perennial problem of passwords. His take, of course, is eliminate them altogether, right? We've talked about this before. And of course, focus on pass keys. Now, additional uh, ones out there is David Lewis from Cisco. He speaks to the concept of security debt. Now, that's also the backlog of vulnerabilities that need to be addressed in your organization. And it's a timely manner that both organizations uh, and individual systems should undergo really some serious and rigorous scrutiny to help you, help you actually minimize the risk. So key takeaways here from uh, cybersecurity awareness stuff, I want to know from my co-host, but before I do, I think it seems fairly clear. It's that the role of CISO is pivotal, right? And cybersecurity is really a collective responsibility. But I want to I want to get my co-host back in because I'm sure there's a lot more to that than just meets the eye there. Kurt, am I close? No, I, I think you are close because the, the thing to remember, um, and a lot of people get this wrong, you hear many people say that your employees, your users, are your first line of defense. Well, if, you're in, if your users are your first line of defense, you are doing security absolutely wrong. Because in truth, your users should be your last line of defense. You should have all kinds of security tools that intercept threats and dangers before things ever get to your users' screens. So that means that if you have things that make it to your users' screens, they've been, they're, they're pretty tricky already. So, to me, the, the keys here are to make your users aware and not just make them aware that there are dangers out there, but make them aware that they have a role to play in cybersecurity to keep you safe. The other thing that I think is even more important is to build a culture where security is important. We have all seen, for, for as long as I've been in business, and that's a long time, frankly, that you have companies say that their core values include things like 
high energy, high productivity, uh, you know, fast, agile, all of those things, <clears throat> security properly done won't have a huge impact on those, but it will have an impact. There is a cost to pausing to think about security. There is a cost to behaving in a secure fashion when you have a bunch of messages coming in. And I'll give you an example. Uh, in fraud, one of the, one of the uh, industries that's always hit hard by fraud is global shipping and transportation. That's because it is common for someone in the office of a shipping company, you know, let, let's call it an office administrator, to get a call or a text or a to go really old school, a telegram from a captain saying, I have just hit the port of somewhere on the other side of the world. And I need to pay my port fees. So I need $25,000 wired to this bank account. I need $25,000 transferred to this organization. And the office admin does it because they have to make the schedule of getting in, docking, and getting their cargo unloaded before they can unload the next cargo. That speed makes it an easy target for people who do adversary in the middle attacks, people who do all kinds of fraudulent claims. What's the alternative? It's having that ad admin empowered to ask a question if things seem wrong. And that's really the key. Making your employees know that they are empowered to ask a question and slow things down on an individual transaction basis if things seem wrong. And even if it turns out it's legitimate, they will not be penalized for having asked the question. That may be, from my point of view, the single most important thing any organization can do letting their employees know that they will not be penalized for acting in a secure way. After that, you get off into the minutia. Right, right. Well, uh, Jeff Maricini is in the chat room again this week, and he's obviously saying he's, he's advocating for the fact that CISOs obviously set the tone, but of course it's a collective. Now, Chibert, I talked a little bit about this. Uh, we talked a little bit about this in the, in the, in the, uh, the summary, is the fact that some organizations are, are basically identifying security champions in their organization. Do you think this is a way to essentially not necessarily pass the buck, but enable more users and more people within the organization to gain that experience and also help others that are around them uh, actually support and secure the organization? Actually, I think it's um, playing towards human nature. So it may sound off the topic, but this is one of the things I had in safety training when, you know, we had to start talking about what to do when we had to um, evacuate something. 80% um, of humans will just sit there and follow the leader. 10% are the ones that will actually go and direct people out they'll take they'll take the lead take responsibility and get the but there's the problem of that last 10 percent so in the case of a burning building that last 10 percent are people that'll run back into the burning building the sad part about human nature is depending on what type of personality you are sometimes you'll just do the wrong thing you know that last 10 percent they exist i've seen it in real life, I actually saw a person go literally run back in a building during an, an earthquake, pieces of masonry falling down. It's like, why are you going back in the building? It's like, we're yelling after this guy. We're throwing stuff at him, trying to get him to come back out. And he, he ended up getting himself hurt quite badly. So anyway, that's too much of a digression. The reality is 
human nature doesn't always make sense. So when reading this article, I kind of started looking at, you know, the opinions of all these different CISOs and security experts. And it's like, okay, I agree with pretty much all of them, but we really and truly have to do all of the above. I think it's going, it's going to end up being a multi-generational thing. Um, we need to have our current school children learn about things like strong passwords, learn about stop using those stupid post-it notes for your passwords, you know, stop putting them in that little pull out drawer, um, you know, the writing table, um, things like that. It's going to take an effort. It's going to take the entire community. Um, hopefully you don't have the village idiot doing something really stupid and, you know, clicking on something, you're going to have it, but a lot of it's education. I totally agree with Kurt that your users can't be your first line of defense. They have to be your last line because by the time it gets to that, you, you got to get rid of the really convincing stuff that's going to get that village idiot to go and click on it. So there's many, many things to be done, and I don't think it's going to be solved anytime soon. I think it's going to be generations of people before we can have nice things again. And I like the concept of a passwordless environment. You know, I want to be able to go and carry around like a maybe an RFID ring that I scan and then I do a pin. You know, it can't just be the ring because someone can steal my ring. But I'd like to have, you know, multi, you know, some multi factors. You know, it's what I used to use in the military. I would s scan my badge or dongle or what have you, and I had to follow it up with a pin. I think something like that's going to f need to be normal rather than freaking out your users. Uh, this is and Ant. You, you, I wanted to jump in here because I'm, I'm listening to you two argue that the users should not be the last, the first line of defense. And I agree that they should not be, but I'm going to turn that back on you and tell you that usually they are because they're the easiest vector in most of these instances. Correct. Oh yeah. You know, it, you think about it, the, you gave the, the, the example of the email or the wire of the wire transfer or what have you. Okay. So right. how many users know to look at the actual email address that it came from or anything like that. Most of them don't. They just saw the, that it came from so-and-so executive or better yet. What if it doesn't even come through email? What if there is some rogue salesperson on the team that knows they're already out the door and says, walks right up to them and say, Hey, I got this flash drive. Can you print this thing off for me real quick? And you know, sure. You know, it, I, it's, it's just the easy vector by going to the users and bypassing right. firewalls and stuff like that. And I will say that what you've just said is one of the reasons that social engineering is so effective because in a social engineering attack, which is most of what you've talked about, the user is in fact the first level of defense in things like most malware attacks, ransomware, all of that. Those messages go through many layers of security before they ever end up on someone's desktop. But in something like a the phone calls, the somebody showing up with, with a thumb drive in their hand, those are social engineering attacks. And there is a real reason why most criminal hackers, if you ask them, they will tell you that the easiest way to get someone's admin credentials is to ask them for it. You know, we talk, we talk about, and we, we've done it here on uh, Twiat. Yeah. We, we hit all of these vulnerabilities that will give, allow people to get secrets from various things and we'll go and break encryption and all that. They may be effective. They, they are in, indeed threats, but they aren't nearly as effective as calling someone up saying that you're from, um, add the admin services right and you need to make do an update to their computer so you need their credentials in order to do that yeah you know if you just get someone to hand you their credentials why do you need to go to the trouble 
of, you know, burning a zero day or even using the the technical prowess behind some of these uh, bits of malware. So you're right. And it's why there are different classes of attacks, different classes of, of, okay. yeah. um, of security problems. Classification <laughs> at all. That makes sense. Because uh, you, you talked actually, about the, the post-it note with the passwords, and I just laughed to myself because we've all seen that. But I've seen just mm-hmm. as many users knowing each other's passwords just because they were told. <laughs> like, why are you telling somebody else your password? Well, in case I'm out I on know. vacation... No, yeah, exactly. Still should not know yeah. your daggum password. Okay, I'm going to quit ranting now because this is y'all show, uh, not mine. <laughs> yeah, and actually, one of my absolute favorite social engineering was done during um, a cyber range uh, activity at, that I sponsored, and one of my female students decided that um, she was going to take advantage of her gender, and she wore a scandalous miniskirt. And she social engineered herself into an admin account and she was on the red team and she just went crazy and managed to really do some damage to the blue team. It was hilarious. Good on her. Good and, on her. and I told her, Oh my goodness, that is so sexist. And she goes, yeah, but I'm female. I can get away with it. And it's like, Oh, that is so wrong on so many levels. Kidding. Well, I think I think this is an interesting take. Obviously, we I want to talk a little bit about the fact of the password side of things really quick because I think this is something that organizations continue to find challenging across across their entire organization, which is the fact that you know, you know, obviously it's pretty easy for Google to talk about passkey and the fact that they're obviously turning it on for everything and they're a big organization that focuses solely on uh, partially on uh, mainly on security in some aspects. Uh, but I guess the question to you guys is, you know, obviously we've talked about pass keys in the past. We've talked about, you know, strong passwords, but most organizations, they have legacy software. They have older software. They have older services that they have to integrate and they still have to use passwords. They're still using federation. They're still using things like that, that could enable this, you know, obviously these vulnerabilities in 2024, what's, what's, what's the next step for those organizations? What, what should they do first? That that's not going to cost them an arm and a, arm and a leg basically. If people want to make their credentials better, I have one phrase um, to teach your users, passphrase. Teach them that a phrase is better than a word. Teach them that this is my first corporate password with a number one and a couple of pieces of um, punctuation at the end is a much better password than the name of their dog backwards with a zero where the O should be, or, you know, something like that. The longer it gets, the stronger it is. Yeah. And one of my, so, oh, I'm sorry. So you can doing something like that. And Oh, by the way, a technical piece of that is get rid of the thing that says we need an, a strong password, but it can only be seven characters and can't <laughs> include any of the following special characters. Okay. Yep. I said I was done ranting, but. You, you brought up another one. Sorry. That right there, you think about the banking systems. Uh, most of them are using a lot of legacy software and what have you. I yeah. get that because it's it's pretty good. But at the same time, I can't tell you how many banks I've come across that said this password is too long. Seriously? You're a daggum bank. Come on, get it together. Yeah, uh, so one of the things that I hate, and we're going to poke fun at a bank again, is we want a strong password, but can only have, you know, this, that, and the other thing. And the special characters can only be these. Yeah, it can't be a carrot. <laughs> yeah. And so I use, I'm a big user of Bitwarden. So I think they're a sponsor. So I got to say sponsor, flag, sponsor. Um, I let Bitwarden go and generate random passwords for me, but I can't with certain organizations because I have to turn off the special characters, then go in, look at the password generated and manually stick their special characters in, which drives me nuts and takes quite a bit of time. Actually, Uh, I'd rather you just be able to go and stick in really long, ridiculous, random passwords. So one last rant. 
one of the things I started teaching when I, when I did a cyber, well, it wasn't, a, it was a cyber awareness class for retirees, you know? So oh, I did this for an old folks home and they said, I can never remember this stuff and I have to write it down. It's like, no, one thing you're probably really, really good at is remembering the lyrics for your favorite song. Just take the lyrics and use the first character from each word for the first, you know, stanza. And then change a few things to, you know, instead of an A, put an at sign. Instead of, you know, an I, put in an uh, exclamation point, things like that. And the look on this elderly woman's face was, I can do that. So I go one step further. I happen to use a lot of Hawaiian lyrics. And so far in all my dealings during DEF CON, the dictionary hacks don't have Hawaiian. They might after this, but you know, right now, dictionary hacks. Thanks so for leaking that tip. Been, yeah, sorry. You know, sorry, use Swahili then. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I think I think these are all great techniques, especially uh, although you know you have to actually remember lyrics, and I think that would be my problem. Uh, but I think you know passphrases are always great, so so I definitely agree with that. Well, folks, I think that does it for the bites because we have lots more to talk about here, and we're going to get back into some techniques to how to secure your organization and also securing DNS in just a moment. But before we do, we do have to thank a really great sponsor of this week at Enterprise Tech. And that's Collide. Collide is a device trust solution for companies with Okta. They make it so that if a device isn't trusted and secure, it can't log into your cloud apps. If you work in security or IT and your company has Okta, keep listening here. Have you noticed that for the past few years, the majority of data breaches and hacks you read about have something in common? That's right. It's employees. We just talked about this. Sometimes an employee's device gets hacked because of unpatched software or something similar. Sometimes an employee leaves sensitive data in an unsecured place, and it seems like every day a hacker breaks into using credentials they fished from another employee. Well, the problem here is, isn't your end users. It's the solutions that are supposed to be, prevent those data breaches. But it doesn't have to be this way. Imagine a world where only secure devices can access your cloud apps. In this world, fish credentials are useless to hackers and you can manage every OS, including Linux, all from a single dashboard. And best of all, you can get your employees to fix their own device security issues without creating more work for your IT team. Good news is you don't have to imagine this world. You can just start using Collide. Visit collide.com slash twy to book an on-demand demo today and see how it works for yourself. That's K-O-L-I-D-E dot com slash twyde. And we thank Collide, their support of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, it's my favorite part of the show. We actually get to bring in a guest to drop some knowledge on the Twi Riot. Today we have Josh Kual. Welcome to the show, Josh. Hi. Appreciate nice you being be here. Now, you you have a little bit of history, right, with uh, with Chibert? Yes, I do. In fact, with uh, with Kurt as well. Uh, we all we all met in Hawaii while I studied computer science in in, uh, in Hawaii. Fantastic. Now, you are you're working at Infoblox now. You know, you focus on cybersecurity there. Yes. So my main role at Infoblox is um, I take technical, difficult topics, try to explain it much like what you guys do on the show, <laughs> and then to you know explain that, break it down for our customers so they understand not just how the product works, but why. I mean, why would you, you know, why you would make certain configuration choices depending right. on your requirements? Now, in the past, we've, we've obviously talked about, and that's why we're, we wanted you to come on because we've talked about some some topics in the past, and we wanted to just dive deeper into these topics because I think, um, you know, a lot of our our, our listeners are in the IT and security space, and they're always looking for better techniques, especially in the case of we just recently talked about Unicode. Now, maybe. You know, as a um, professional that kind of focuses on this types of stuff, you know, can you tell us maybe a little bit more about how, what you see as Punicode and 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 how it's impacting things like DNS? Sure. Yeah. So Punicode, basically, you can think of it as a DNS encoding scheme. Um, mo most most of the time, as end users, we're not going to see Punicode, 
And if you do, you probably would flip out because it looks scary. Um, but the reason for Punico to exist uh, is because we wanted to internationalize the internet, right? It's in, um, in original state, it's all English, ASCII, right? This, that's you know, all the programming languages you can only type in English letters. So that was quite unfair for the rest of the world that are not speaking English. Uh, and by the way, I speak Mandarin. I'm, um, so, you know, that, and I've lived in Taiwan uh, recently uh, for, for a while, for a few years. So I do see there's a significant part of the world that's relying on puny co-working because that's how they can type in their local language into whatever software they're using. And DNS will be able to translate that using Punicode um, and then take them to the right place. Now, what's what's the difficulty around battling against such an exploit? What 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 are what are organizations running into here? Do you think? So I think the the the, the so first let's define what's what the difficulty is here. Sure. So the, so from the from last week's uh, show, the the what happened was. You, because now we have access to not just English letters and numbers, I can pick a Cyrillic O that looks very much like a English O. Or in last week's case, it picks a, um, a letters that I can't pronounce. I think it was like a special K um, that looks like an English K, right? That is very difficult for humans to detect. Uh, it's in, in fact, actually, in some cases, it's impossible. The Greek Omicron letter in some certain fonts look exactly like an O. There's no way for humans to tell. Um, and a little bit on, you know, on my gripe about the registrars a little bit. Not every domain name registrar are security conscious. They're just happy to sell you a new domain name for ten ninety nine dollars a year. Um, some are better at, than, than the rest. So there's a lot of threat actors out there go, look, I can go register, you know, for example, uh, google.com. I'm going to swap out the O's with the Greek Omicron O. And I'm going to make a website that looks exactly like Google. And that's what happened uh, on the, the, the show last year. The news was somebody did that for KeePass. Um, no fault of KeePass. Just somebody says, look, it's a very popular domain name. I want to get it. I legally own it for whatever the, 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 the strange spelling is. Then now as a threat actor who legally owns the name, I can go get a certificate that looks exactly like that. So when you go click on your web browser, everything looks perfectly normal. You get that little lock, lock pad. This is all secure by TLS and your eyes can't tell the difference. So that's the problem. Right. And then like we were just talking about uh, the, all three of you were talking about the uh, users being either actually i think it's both the first line and the last line defense um so we don't want you know we but we, but we all agree we want to offload as much from the user as we can so telling your users to look at these letters or characters carefully is not the solution um the solution would be your dns this, is, this comes originates from dns from domain names that's where we need to fix it um, so there are several approaches right now. There is a initiative called the uh, DNS Abuse Institute. They're trying to do it from a governing point of view to argue to the domain name registrars uh, and, uh, and I, I can to say, look, we got to have some policies in here. Uh, you can't sell internet security for 1099 a year. Okay, that's just not a good trade off. Somebody wants to buy Google.com with the misspelled O, we got to be able to say no. Um, so there's some, there's some efforts going on there. Um, but just kind of like Congress governing, it's going to take a while. And meanwhile, we have something, uh, for the rest of the world. Uh, it's basically filtering. Um, so, uh, the, the, the technology behind it is called RPZ. It's a, got a kind of nerdy name response policy zone. Basically we leverage DNS itself to say, look, if somebody asked you, Somebody, some user comes to you, say, I want to go to keypass.com. Okay. But that K, K is the, you know, it doesn't matter what it's spelled like. I mean, it could be even say infoblocks.com. It could be twit.com. And in the back end, this DNS server, we'll, we'll call it a protective DNS server, 
would have the intelligence loaded ahead of time to say, these are the bad places. If somebody asks you of any of these names, I don't care if they're spelled in English, in Korean, in Chinese, whatever, we don't care. As long as I know it's a bad destination, I'm going to lie to the uh, end users um, and just say this name doesn't exist. Now, I'd rather they get a page timeout or they get an error message in the web browser than taking them to a KeePass or Google lookalike place and get infected. So again, that's uh, so that so that technology exists. It's called um, broadly protective DNS. Um, and usually at the core of that product or packaging is the technology called response policies on RPZ. And where do these policies get applied at? Do they get like, for instance, if I am an organization that has some web services or some services that I host on, let's say, AWS and I use their DNS services, where do I go and, and actually set this all up? What do I go patch? Where do I go set, set the policies at? Very good. Very good question. So it would be at the so there are two types of DNS servers, the ones that find answers and the ones that host answers. So this will be the ones that find answers. So I think most listeners would know uh, Google public DNS 8.8.8.8 uh, 4 .4 .4 .4 .4. So it would be these servers. It would be whatever your devices or even at home, if you have a home little router slash DNS server, um, that's where you want to add these policy. But then, of course, it's like, well, where do you get the, the, that list of bad people from? Um, so that's where some of the commercial, because uh, it's, it's a full-time job and more to keep up with malicious domains being registered on a, I don't want to even say it's not even hourly. It's every minute, every second, there's new domain names being registered that are malicious. So there are companies who dedicate themselves uh, including my employer. That's what they do. They, and then they get the list, they publish it, push it out to the, uh, to people who can get it. Now, if you are at home, I know most of the listeners are enterprise background. So you probably already have something similar. Uh, but for the home users, there are free of cost, uh, uh, uh alternatives. Uh, so quad nine, nine dot nine dot nine dot nine is a, uh, nonprofit organization. Uh, if you point your, I, I, um, if you point your home DNS lookup to this IP address, and if you somehow try to go to a malicious DNS name, it will lie to you and say, I'm going to lie for, to, to protect you. It, that doesn't exist. That name doesn't exist. Time out. This is all great stuff. And we have a lot more to talk about here, but I, I did want to bring back into Brian Chi and Curtis Franklin as well. But before we do, we do have to thank one more sponsor of this week at Enterprise Tech and that is Miro. It's the online workspace for innovation. But what does that mean exactly? And how can it actually help you? Well, Miro is one incredible visual place that brings all of your innovation together. And no matter where you're located, it's packed with the right things to be your dream products home base. That's right. We're talking about six whole compatibility bundles from product development workflows to content visualization. It's powered by Miro AI. That means you're generating new ideas or summarizing complex information pretty much instantly. Now, Miro can work for any team, but product development teams really get the full experience here. It offers teams the richest feature set of any visual workspace with specific tools to help with strategy or processing map mapping, facilitating tools to actually run effective design and agile sprints. You pretty much get the picture here. Now, with Miro Connects, super seamless to your platforms. You're already using like Jira, Confluence, Google, or Asana. So you centralize work in a way that makes sense for your team. They don't need to leave Miro to update projects or statuses in any of those tools. Tools You can actually do it all through Miro. It also ends up being a massive time saver. That's right. Miro users report saving up to 80 hours per year because they streamline conversations. They cut down on meetings and they see all the most up-to-date information in just one place. Miro also just released a board video recording feature called Talk Track to save even more time. We're talking about pre recording your thoughts and leaving it on the board instead of scheduling the millionth meeting for the week. Go on, try it out for yourself. Get your first three boards free to start working better at Miro.com slash podcast. That's M I R O dot com slash podcast. And we thank Miro for their support of this week in enterprise tech. 
Well, folks, we were talking with Josh Corral. He's he's the senior educator and SME at, in cybersecurity of InfoBlox. We're talking about, of course, puny code and DNS security. But I want to I want to also bring my co-host back in and, of course, reconnect Brian and Josh together. Brian, I'm going to throw it to you first. All right. <clears throat> now, so just f- for your information, chat room, I actually copy copied and pasted the Unicode and the puny code for the same website. So this is a Taiwanese website. So Mr. Ant, could you please display the screenshot? Okay, so that's the website. Both the Unicode and Punicode both go to the same Taiwanese website. So if we could bring up the screenshot. So for the people listening on audio, sorry. Um, <laughs> the image is basically the Unicode version, which is Taiwanese characters, well, and Chinese characters. Josh, is that Mandarin? Yes, that's traditional Chinese. Okay, thank you. And then Punicode, which is going to the same website, but you can type it on an English keyboard. So anyway, <clears throat> what I wanted to kind of do is, Josh, for me, was very unique because he had he was actually a licensed Mandarin interpreter, not a translator, interpreter. And for those of you that don't know the difference, a translator just... You know, that you could machine translate something, but an interpreter might, instead of having um, one word that doesn't translate very well, it he would go and he or she would go and put in a different phrase that would convey the meaning rather than just the dictionary. So anyway, um, what I wanted to get Josh to do is describe a little bit on what it's like to be working with your lang- your native language, in this case, Mandarin, um, but in an English-speaking world, what are the frustrations? What are the things that, you know, why is this problem happening? And uh, what's it like, you know, trying to mm-hmm. browse the internet in Taiwan? Yeah, sure. So, yeah, I, I, I lived in Taiwan for a few years um, and, and, and yeah, I, I watched my, my parents, they were, they would struggle because, you know, in in order to access the Internet, you're basically setting this barrier to say you have to know English. Uh, you cannot get to a website unless you know basic English letters. Like, how would you feel if we tell you you can't go to a website unless you just spell it in Japanese? That's going to be pretty hard. So I think this is a really great technology that's bringing the access of Internet to everyone, every language. Um, and it's actually been around for quite a while. The standards been around. Uh, a lot of the technical standards kind of work this way. It becomes technically possible, but it takes years or even decades to make it to the consumer market. So you, Punico has been around for about 20 years, uh, but took a long time for registrars to support it, software vendors to support it, for people to start take notice, go, oh, I don't have to register, say, website.tw for Taiwan. I can do it in native language written characters. So that's much more accessible to everyone, uh, all the users. Yeah, so like one of the things I'll, on a regular basis, when I start researching a topic, I will purposely uh, try to do the research in different languages. Sadly, I, my foreign languages are weak. So I will go and use the Google Translate or Microsoft Translate. You know, I'll use a machine translator and start using different language versions so that I can get a different view. And, you know, the other thing we do is Twyet is an international show. We have questions and comments coming in from, well, most of the continents. Um, And so I've kind of taken up, taken myself i say i need to go and at least try and find the the limitations of these translators so that i can find where what kind of mistakes i might make so that i don't go and accidentally call someone you know something nasty anyway <clears throat> so if i'm on an american machine and i purposely want to go to a um taiwanese website you know, 
obviously I'm going to have to learn how to do puny code. Now, here's, here's where the real question comes in. Mm. How the heck do I find those puny code sites? Well, you could just go to a, you know, Google for any kind of puny code, um, converter. There's a bunch of those on, on the internet. That's pretty easy. Um, but that probably wouldn't be, I'm thinking, um, the user experience because most of the users today, they, they access, especially the target audience, uh, would be, they are on smart devices, like a mobile phone. Um, so like for, again, using my parents as examples, um, they would change, uh, they would just use the finger to write because Chinese characters are pretty complicated. You can't really type. So they will actually use mm -hmm. fingers to draw out the characters they want and, it, and then select the one they want from the, uh, from the screen. So I'm going to do another example so that our viewers and listeners can get a little bit more of a taste. So one of my past jobs was working for Fujitsu Limited of Japan. So I started learning a little bit of Japanese. I was, I, I knew enough so I could order a drink. <clears throat> However, one of the things that I was working with were JIS keyboards, Japan International Standard. And the one that Fujitsu had on their word processor actually had four shift keys. And what we would do is you would use, so in Japanese, you have two really basic characters, hiragana and katakana. Hiragana is more of the, I am a Japanese word. Katakana is used for foreign words. What you would do on these is you would type in the hiragana phrase, and then you would, it would, highlight and you'd use the shift keys and you can actually roll through scroll through the different kana which is the the chinese characters the more complex ideograms <clears throat> so i guess it starts coming down to it's a very very different world <clears throat> and i wanted our viewers and listeners to get a little bit of a glimpse because our show you know the shows in general tend to be very western centric and this is not just Mandarin, not just Cantonese, not just Korean. Um, there are quite a few different languages and it's not always English. So I, I've actually do a decent number of searches in Spanish. Uh, one of Josh's fellow students, Blanca, is a native speaker. Um, she always tells me, don't speak Spanish. It makes my head hurt because my Spanish is so bad. <laughs> <clears throat> but it's good enough that I can actually do searching with it. I challenge our viewers, when you do a search, if it has any kind of international flavor, just try it. Try searching in different languages. You'd be really, really surprised at how a different view um, from different countries can really change your mind about how things are working. So anyway, that that's it on my soapbox. I know Kurt's just going crazy. He wants he wants to get in on this conversation. So I'm, I'm going to toss it over to Kurt. Well, I appreciate that, Brian. You know, Josh, one of the questions I have is this: we we've been talking about the different ways that companies and even individuals can provide a layer of security from um the the threat actors that would use confusion over uh puny code or similar schemes to get you to malicious uh websites in most use in most daily uses would most users notice that one of these systems was in place i mean is it going to throw a delay in is it going to cause any side effect that would make a an individual or a company say, oh, that's just too expensive when it comes to productivity to let us do this? Um, no, that's a really good question. That, And I think the answer uh, is a not just a no, but I think it'll make the performance tick uh, upward. Because think about all the things that's behind between between the user and the resource they want to access on the internet there's a web proc well, I don't, people are still using web proxy 
firewall, lots of security apparatus uh, that are inserted between the customer or the and, and client, or your web browser usually, and whatever you want to get to. Now, let's say I go to a malicious website, right? The, 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 uh, the, without the DNS protection in place, I go there and fingers crossed, one of these firewall, one of these security devices will catch me and stop bad things from happening. Maybe I, you know, I click on the wrong link at this website that's impersonating KeyPass or Google, and it's about to send me some malware, then these security uh, devices will stop it. Well, why, why even go to the layer three, two, four, five, when we can add a new layer in front of that, where DNS can just say, well, there's no need to go there. We know it's bad. Okay, I can save you cycles on your firewall, on your security devices, by just telling the user, don't go there. Well, you know, telling the user not to go there is, is as you say, it's the cleanest solution. But I know that several of the things that we've been talking about, you know, you've mentioned things like Quad9 and, and the other DNS servers. This is the servers that provide the answers. Um, and the way they will protect people from inadvertently going to malicious sites. But if someone is on a mobile device, they're typically locked into the DNS server that their mobile provider gives them. So is there any way that people can be safer if they are going to a website from a mobile device? That's a really good question. Yes, and you are right. For so unfortunately, I think for the home user, the non-enterprise, you might there might not be a good solution for them. But for the for the folks that are on the enterprise uh, network or devices, there are commercial products um, and that will install agents or software on your laptops, mo mobile devices, whatnot. So when you take your mobile device to say to Starbucks, to some kind of coffee shop to work, then the DNS setting is still being sent to whatever your protective DNS service may be. So you're not using the one from say T-Mobile or Starbucks, or that would be rewritten, redirected to the corporate sanctioned secure uh, lookup uh, target. Well, my, my last question, this is a great conversation that we're having you know i i appreciate you you sharing your your wealth of knowledge with us but you know if someone wants to to be better at searching if they want to do, be more secure would you recommend that they just find a secure dns server punch that into their settings and and forget it or is there a someplace they can go to learn more about the DNS issues so that they can make better choices and make better decisions when it comes to setting up their DNS service environment. Okay, so that's in the unpack that into so that's actually a really good place for me to add in on um, that the term DNS security or secure DNS has a lot of different meanings depending on who you're talking to. Uh, if I'm talking to the end user, she might think, oh, that's privacy. That means no one can see what, where I'm going to. I want encryption. Uh, you're talking to the network server admin. They're thinking, oh, you're talking about server service protection, that my servers are hacker free. They are not being taken down by DDoS. Right. That's another type of that's what they think security is. And there's yet another category for the information security uh, professionals. Uh, there's a whole nother uh, area that we haven't even gotten into is you can use DNS as the transport. Once somebody got into your network and stole some credit card numbers, DNS is a really sneaky way to take that credit card number out. So those are, you know, and then so there's another category of people who are like, well, I want to watch what is actually happening over DNS and catch these thefts in real time. Um, so unfortunately, I don't think there's really like a single place uh, 
that I know of that you can learn all of this because that's three, at least three different target audiences. Uh, but for the very last group, I'm happy to say at least I have written a publisher book with my co-author Ross on that very topic. Uh, so you could, you know, if you if you would like to learn more about how DNS plays a factor, uh, how basically how bad guys are abusing DNS to evade detection, um, uh, uh, you can go ahead and get the book. Uh, it's uh, available on Amazon. Fantastic. Thank you, Josh. It's a fantastic conversation. I'm sure that there's plenty more to talk about here, but unfortunately, we have run a l little bit out of time here. Maybe tell the folks at home where they can learn more about Infoblox as well. Um, really, it's just infoblox.com and just make sure you pay attention. It's not like an L for the I or a zero for the O, right? Get to the right website. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate you taking your time. Thank you. Well, folks, you've done it again. You sat through another hour of the best dang enterprise and IT podcast in the universe. So definitely tune your podcatcher to Twyet. I want to make sure I thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially to my wonderful co-host. Sorry, the very own Mr. Brian Chi Chibert. What's going on for you this coming week? Well, you know, I'm going to lose my mind. It's, it's time for Maker Fair. Now, I, I'm going to point out one thing. That screen that screenshot that I did for Amazon for Josh's book, you'll notice that Kindle it said free, because it actually is under Kindle Unlimited, which I happen to be a subscriber, so I can download it to my Kindle. I'm I'm actually using the big the big Kindle the Kindle Scribe, so I can actually take notes, so that when I read Josh's book, I can go and grade him. <laughs> <laughs> Josh is cracking up because he's getting flashbacks now. What's the name of the book for our folks that are not watching the video? Sorry. It is The Hidden Potential of DNS and Security, colon, Combating Malware, Data Exfiltration, and More, The Guide for Security Professionals. It's available in paperback, hardback, and Kindle. Anyway, um, you can hear my ranting if you're interested in hearing my ranting. I still use Twitter. I still call it Twitter instead of X. I, I think X is still a kind of a dumb name. But, you know, Elon is Elon. Anyway, my Twitter address is ADVNETLAB, Advanced Net Lab, which harks back to the days when I was running a lab that Josh and his wife Cynthia um, were interns in. You're also welcome to throw email, and my email is chebert, spelled C-H-E-E-B-E-R-T at twit.tv, or if you send email to twiet at twit.tv, it'll hit all the hosts. We'd love to hear your opinions. We'd love to hear your show suggestions. And um, truthfully, if you folks like this episode, I've been getting a lot of requests for us to go into a lot more detail on things. And Josh and I have been talking about possibly doing a short series um, sometime in the near future. And we can go, he and his co-author Ross can go and dive into a lot more detail because you folks have been actually asking for it. You, you want more detail on DNS. We, we've done DNS. We actually had Josh's friend Cricket Lou on. He's the author of DNS and Bind. Um, but every time we run something on DNS, you folks keep asking for more detail. So we're working on it. Thanks. Thanks, Cheever. We also have to thank our very own Mr. Curtis Franklin. Curtis, what's going on for you in the coming week? Where can people find you? Well, there's going to be a lot of Maker Fair happening this week, um, starting with this weekend when I'm getting ready, and then later in the week when it's actually almost happening and then happening. Um, but there is a little bit of work going on for my day job. Got, uh, some, a couple of, uh, great interviews coming up to put together reports. I've got a couple of things I'm thinking about for articles on LinkedIn. Got some cool analogy stuff rattling around in my head. So that's a good place to look for me. I'm on LinkedIn at LinkedIn slash Curtis Franklin. Uh, on Mastodon, KG4GWA, at mastodon.sdf.org. Um, 
pretty much on all of the social media pipes. I would love to hear from the Twiat Riot. If there's something that you think is important, some sort of trend you think is coming up in security, let me know. I would love to get your take on it. I mean, I'm professionally opinionated, but that doesn't mean I don't like hearing other people's opinions too. Thanks, Kurt. Well, we also have to thank you as well. You're the person who drops in each and every week to watch and to listen to our show to get your enterprise and IT goodness. We want to make it easy for you to listen and catch up on your IT enterprise news. So go to our show page right now, twit.tv slash twiat. There it is. There you find all of our amazing back episodes, of course, show notes, co-host information, all that great information there. But more importantly, next to those videos there, you'll get those helpful subscribe and download links. That's right. Support the show by getting your audio version, your video version of your choice. Listen on any one of your devices or any one of your podcasts applications because we're on all of them so definitely subscribe and download and support the show now you may have also heard we also have club twit as well that's right it's a members only ad-free podcast service with a bonus twit plus feed that you can't get anywhere else and it's only seven dollars a month and there's a lot of great things that come with club twit not only do you get exclusive access to the discord server but you also have special events you have lots of discussions going on lots of fun stuff so definitely join club twit twit be part of that movement. Go to twit.tv slash club twit. Now, club twit also offers corporate group plans as well. It's a great way to give your entire team access to our ad free tech podcast. Plans start with five members uh, with a discounted rate of $6 each per month. And you can add as many seats as you like. It's a really great way for your IT departments, developers, tech teams, your support team, whichever, to stay up to date with access to all of our podcasts. And just like that regular membership there, they can join the Twit Discord server and also do the Twit Plus bonus feed as well. So definitely check out Club Twit, twit.tv slash Club Twit. Now, after you subscribe and you download, definitely impress your friends, your family members, your coworkers with a gift of Twiat. During that holiday season coming up, so definitely give them the gift of Twiat. We talk a lot about fun, some fun tech topics on this show, and I guarantee they will find it fun and interesting as well. So definitely share it with them, have them download and subscribe. Now, if you've already subscribed, we do this show Fridays live. That's right. Fridays at 1.30 p.m. Pacific time. You can go to live.twit.tv. Watch the streams there. You can come see how the pizza's made, all the behind the scenes, all the fun and banter before and after the show. So definitely check out the live stream. And if you're going to watch the live stream, definitely check out our, our infamous IRC channel as well, Twit Live channel. You can just go to your browsers at irc.twit.tv and it'll pop you right into the channel there. You'll see some amazing characters that we have each and every week. We always have some great conversations in there and we also have some fun. So definitely check that out, irc.twit.tv. Now, if you want to get a hold of me, please hit me up on x.com slash lumm. I'm out there all the time posting stuff. Also, I post enterprise tidbits on and little bits of stuff on LinkedIn as well. So definitely check me out on Louis Moresca on LinkedIn. I get a lot of direct messages each and every week there about the show, about, about things to talk about, topics, uh, about getting started in the industry, stuff like that. So definitely hit me up. I'd love to hear from you and talk about that. If you want to know what I do during my, my work week at Microsoft, please check out developers.microsoft.com slash office. There we post all the amazing, great ways for you to make your office experience more customizable for you, whether you want to customize Outlook or Word or Excel. And in fact, if you check out the Microsoft 365 version of Excel, if you have that right now, go check Excel right now and pop over to the Automate tab once you open Excel. And that's where my team lives. They, they allow you to customize your experience by creating these modern macros, which actually can be JavaScript, you can execute and run in Power Automate flows. So you can create orchestrations and amazing cloud integration. So definitely check that out because it'll really make your team and your data analysis more productive for you. I want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially to Leo and to Lisa. They continue to support This Week in Enterprise Tech each and every week. And we couldn't do the show without them. So thank you for all their support over the years. I also want to thank all the staff and the engineers at Twit. Of course, we couldn't do the show without them. And of course, I want to thank Mr. Brian Chi one more time because he's not only our co-host, but he's also our tireless producer. He does all the show bookings and the plannings before the show. So we definitely couldn't do the show without him. So thank you, Chibert, for all your support. And of course, thank you to our editor for today because they make us look good after the fact. They cut out all of my mistakes. So thank you very much for that. And of course, thank you to our Technical director for today, our TD for day, Mr. Ant Pruitt. And it's always great to have you on. And I love that you actually participated today because you had some good questions there. But you, you also have some great shows here on Twit as well. What's going on this week for Twit? Thank you, Mr. Lou. And again, sorry for my earlier rant during the show. 
<laughs> just struck a nerve. That's all. It just struck a nerve. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we had a lot going on, as you mentioned, with Club Twit. We had an escape room happening uh, just the other day. That was a lot of fun, and it's only available to our Club Twit members to view. So make sure you uh, sign up to check that out. Uh, but a lot of great tech topics discussed on This Week in Google. That's twit.tv slash twig as miss paris martin though has joined the show and uh folks feel free to check out antpruitt.com slash prints if you're looking for some art for your walls it's the holiday season coming up uh arts for your office arts for your home office um arts for your favorite bar you know just in case you know you got a favorite bar you can get that shot of whiskey right there or dram of whiskey and offer that up too antpruitt.com slash prince you had me at whiskey (laughs) (laughs) gonna need that print then thanks chiever thanks thanks i appreciate it well until next time i'm lewis moresca just reminding you if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise just keep quiet it's midweek and you really want to know even more about the world of technology So you should check out Tech News Weekly, the show where we talk to and about the people making and breaking the tech news. It's the biggest news. We talk with the uh, people writing the stories that you're probably reading. We also talk between ourselves about the stories that are getting us even more excited about tech news this week. So if you're excited, well, then join us. Head to twit.tv slash TNW to subscribe.